And welcome, Kristen, to Mindful Social. I'm so excited that you can be here because I think you're an amazing community manager. And I've watched your work for a long time, even though we've never spoken before, which is the beauty of Blab, isn't it? It is. It is. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So why don't you tell people a little bit about who you are and what you do so that they know a little bit more? Okay. Um, like you said, I am a community manager. And unlike a lot of folks in the in the area, I have sort of found my way over, over time into doing this. Um, it's not something that I set out to do. Um, I found that I love being engaged with communities and learning from communities and sharing information, that kind of thing. I found it over time with doing bits and pieces of it um, as a volunteer or as part of a, of a larger scope of work. Um, and as time has gone on and really in the past few years, I realized, okay, this is my thing. This is what I enjoy doing. So currently I work with uh, Convince and Convert, which is Jay Bear's team. Um, totally amazing. And I also do some work with with yeah, Jay's amazing. He's actually on a blab right now. We're not going to talk about how I'm on a blab at the same time as him. Um, but also, so I work. I'm super excited to work with them. I just started working with them a couple months ago, and they are all just fantastic. So with that, I am going to be working on building up the community of the actual Convince and Convert blog and the team. Uh, most people are familiar with Jay, and he's a powerhouse and well deserved. Um, he's a shining example of how to work with a community to build, nurture, and so on. But I'm going to be working on highlighting some of what the team is doing and trying to give some things back on behalf of the actual team because they tend to mm. sort of lurk behind the curtain a little. And they're too awesome for that. So I also do a little work with V3B, uh, V3 Broad Suite, um, which is um, they have several different uh, things going on that I get to work with. There's actually one going on right now that they're involved with called SB50 Disrupt, which is around mm, the Super Bowl. Huge. And I was actually just in another blab for that. And I had to say, OK, I'm out. <laughs> so, yeah, You're but, a busy so, girl. and then I do <laughs> some other like. I still have a love for um, for us, by us, kind of volunteering. So on Fridays, I'm involved with the community manager hangout, CMGR hangout chat. Mm -hmm. um, that is, it's it's all a volunteer effort. And my piece of it is that I just sort of moderate in Twitter, and then I do a little recap post. So I That's stay busy. That's a great chat for community managers. I think the the CMGR group in itself, the hangout's really great, but I love the Twitter chat. And there's yeah. also, are you, you're in the Facebook group too, which yes, they're, is amazing. It's actually really good, not just for community professionals, but for anyone whose work maybe is even adjacent because they hit on some really good topics around everything from social tools to human psychology. I mean, you name it. So definitely passionate about that. And, and I'm a big fan of the, the people that are involved with it. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I see some of our, Friends Dana Dietrich and Laura Norvig, who are also really great community managers. And of course, Rachel Miller. So, you know, we've got a really good group of people who understand community here. But for people who don't know a lot about community, we were talking about this before we started. You know, the biggest challenge for community managers who are starting a new community is getting people to talk back to you. You can talk until you're blue in the face, which I'm really good at, but how do you get people to talk back to you? So can we go there a little bit? Yeah, um, and this is so important because it can be such a, it's almost like a, an emotional heartbreak um, when you, especially if it's a, a community that you're just genuinely, truly passionate about, whether you're being paid or not paid, you know, it's emotional, right? So the thing about, the thing about that is I feel like over time I've learned when you start out, that is a given. You you have to know that almost just, just assume that nobody's going to talk to you. And if you go Crickets. into it with that mindset, it takes a little bit of the sting off. It doesn't make it any more gratifying in the beginning, but it can take a little bit of the burn off of that feeling, kind of feeling alone. Um, and so for mm -hmm. me, it's always been about just sort of being consistent and, and continuing to power through because I've found that, it's not always that you need to get the attention of the masses or that you need to get the attention of a superstar. It's that if you keep at it and you're dedicated and you're sincere, you will eventually run into a person or a handful of people who are, who are 
going to become your cheerleaders and are going to be interested in the same message that you're putting out. They're going to be interested in having the conversation. And those are going to be the key people that will help you get started and, and get some traction. And once that happens, then you'll start to get all the warm and fuzzies because then people will start talking to you and you can really find a way to start being valuable when it's a two way discussion. But it really I think it really is about being, frankly, stubborn about it <laughs> and just keeping at it. What do you think? Well, I totally agree with that. I think that finding those. I've always believed that, you know, it isn't about how many people are in the community. It's about how many people are actually engaged. And if you mm -hmm. can find something about the people that join the community initially, then share that and talk to them instead of, you know, yes. pushing forward with your own agenda all the time. If you nurture those people and those relationships, they will love you forever because we all want to be heard. That's a good you know? point. Yeah, you're absolutely right because it really needs to be about the, your your foundation and your sort of your core values going into it. Because mm -hmm. if it if it is about your own agenda, not to say that, especially if it's like a business related community, there may be an agenda. But really, if you think about what a community actually is and what it means, and you stay focused on those people and the returns for those people, then it'll keep you inclined mm -hmm. toward doing what you just said. And yeah, it, it can be, especially if you deal with a lot of volume. I think that can be a challenge for people to sort of forget that. Like they, they might forget it on an average Tuesday when they've been they've been doing something by rote or there's just been a lot going on. But it's good to always step back in and remember what the whole point is behind having a community or why a community would grow or why anyone would even want to be part of a community. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that speaks to to uh, what Rachel said in the chat is that community building isn't build it and they'll come. It's more about identifying like-minded people and join the conversations they're already having. You can't really create a community in a vacuum. Agreed. Right? Agreed. And actually that's, that's a good point because when I was doing something on a volunteer basis back several years ago, I started a community. That's a term I'm using loosely because you can't really start a community, but you know what I mean? So because I've, I was looking for something and I could not find it. Now, if under the same circumstances today, chances are good that I would find it and therefore I would not start something new. I would, I would try to contribute to what was already there. But at the time I couldn't find it. And so I started, I, I started conversations and I started sort of just trying to see if there were any like-minded people out there with the same idea. And the not talking back, the sort of being on your own, I, I did at one point question if, okay, maybe, maybe there's not a community to be had here. <laughs> maybe I'm really the only one that actually is interested maybe in I'm this crazy. idea, <laughs> you know, and that, that was a viable possibility, but it turned out, I stuck with it for a while and it turned out I met one person who like myself at the time had no substantial online presence. She was a person with similar interests to me and she was like, Oh my gosh, yes. And then I was like, Oh, <gasps> You know, and so then we started talking and my first I really came at her probably a little rapidly with just a, a lot of questions about. So do you think this is valid? And are, are you wondering these things? What what are you wondering? What are you looking for? And so that person and then a few others that came on pretty quickly after were really instrumental because I had a general mm -hmm. idea of what I thought would be good. But specifics were really built out by the other members of the community. Yeah. Yeah. And letting them do that. I think I think that helps a lot. And, you know, I mean, I did kind of the same thing. We started an online community in the 90s and early 90s, and we ended up having to build a lot of stories so that people were drawn to the content yes. until they started to comment. But, you know, it can take a very long time before people engage. Uh, you know, and, and you can really feel like you're in a vacuum. Nobody cares. <laughs> Same thing uh, yeah. happens with blogs too. Yeah. I, um, I, I really truly like wrote blog posts on blogger and, um, live journal. And I was on my space. Like this, is, this was serious business and I wasn't trying to pander, but I was just kind of going out and like talking as myself, the way that I saw that mm -hmm. I might communicate within this community if it existed. And some of it was really just comical, like <laughs> almost nonsensical, but it would just be like stuff that I was thinking. And I figured that if there were people out there who'd want to participate, 
they'd be interested in it. And then I did find myself being a little surprised that that happened, <laughs> but that's, that's kind of how it works. You know, you, one way or another, you're starting a conversation. Right. Right. Well, and I think Laura brings up a good thing in the chat too, that depending on the context, maybe you can get a little more success by bringing some people along with you, you know, get people who are vested in it before you launch the community. Cause that gives you a basis. It gives you questions. It gives you lots of things to really, you know, go from, totally and, agree. you know, at least you've got a base then. Oh, look, Brian Fanzo's here. Oh, no. Isn't he Yay. amazing? <laughs> He's awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And I actually did that quite wrong. Um, I, I found it once I, once I had a little bit of a tribe going and these people were all becoming friends with each other and those independent relationships were occurring that weren't dependent upon my involvement, which is so rewarding by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, then I was like, Oh, let's get a council. Let's get some, <laughs> some stuff. But like, I really did it backwards in that regard, but I think that's excellent advice, um, for anyone who's looking to start or, or kickstart um, a movement or a community in that way. I definitely agree with the idea of having some teamwork going on, even if it's just for support, like even if it's just for somebody to sanity check you or run ideas by or offer to do a little bit here or there, whatever it is, I think that's a really good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, doing your homework. I think, you know, a lot of people think that uh, you know, you just create a community and then all of these people instantly find you and are drawn to you and can't wait to talk to you. And that almost never happens. You know, it's it's not that simple. So finding people who are like minded, finding existing communities, even if that community doesn't have maybe the same voice that you do, you can use it as a starting place to find people that you want to draw to your community without really, you know, lurking and scraping people off somebody's site. Yes. How, what else can we do to kind of motivate that community? Let's say that we've got a few people, you know, that are kind of engaged, but we're not getting the level of conversation maybe that management wanted us to get with the community. What kind of ways can we, can we get that going? That's a hard one. Like it, it, that's harder than people think it is. It really is. Um, right. I, I personally <laughs> like taking the tack of, getting, trying to give away certain types of ownership to the people in the community. So rather than just asking them what they think or, you know, talking to them, if there's something that you can give over to them that they can be, become a stakeholder in. And this can be anything from, for example, if you're on a forum, asking your passionate people to become forum moderators, um, mm -hmm. things like that, where they actually, they now have a piece of it. Um, we like to be involved and we like to be part of the story and part of what's going on. So now some people won't want to do that. Some people would rather participate in a more passive way, but normally you're going to find that you have people that are a little bit more um, excited or a little bit more alpha or, or whatever their motivators are. And they're going to enjoy the idea of being a real contributor and being part of the, the structure of things. Now, of course, it really depends on the community and, and what the constraints are, obviously. But anytime that you can get the members of the community to be part of the narrative in a bigger way, that's, I think, the key. Um, user generated content, um, uh, being on the team, being an ambassador, these kinds of things I think are huge. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think anything, anytime you can support the user base, they're going to support you back. But if you don't give them any love, why are they going to give you any love? Exactly. It just doesn't work that way. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to let everybody know, please do ask questions. Uh, we'll be taking questions throughout. And all you have to do is type slash Q in the chat. And we would love to hear what questions you have about building community. Um, Brian says, when you have a rock star community manager like Kristen, it's easy to trust them and let them do what they do. And I totally support that. A good community manager is worth their weight in gold. And there aren't that many of them. There are lots of people that think they're community managers, but really what they're doing is pushing the agenda of the organization. And being a community manager is about nurturing. It's about taking care of your community. What's interesting, Rachel says, go oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Janet. No, I just, Rachel says community is by definition is mutual goals in a group con 
contribution, not a dictatorship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't be a dictator in a community. It's Those true. A lot. But there's a unique challenge presented. And of course, community is, is it's a general term. And when we're talking about online in the digital space, there are all types of communities out there. There's closed communities. Mm -hmm. They're on forums. There are, you know, social media centric only communities that aren't on a certain platform by themselves. There are open groups, closed groups, you know, so on and so forth. But anything that's related to a business or a money-making endeavor, there's probably going to be an agenda there. So the trick for a community manager like me is to manage the goals of the business with the, the needs of the community and the mutual benefit. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie and say that there's not an underlying strategy there that's tied to business goals because there is. However, the idea is to go for the win-win, right? So I think, I think it can get dicey for community managers that work in social media space like I do. Um, but if you have good leadership for the business, and I don't mean me, I mean the people that I work for um, and they have, they have a good understanding of, what communities, what, what purpose a community can serve and how they can benefit their community for the sake of benefiting their community. When you have that underlying uh, foundation starting out, it helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Now, both of us have been in community for a really long time and we got a question. Um, how have community expectations changed over the last two years? You know, that's a good that's question. That's like a huge one. And yeah, it's been around for a long time. Well, I think that the digital space overall is getting really, really so much more crowded and it's growing exponentially that I do think sometimes it puts a negative slant. Um, you know, we're talking about ROI and we're talking about, okay, I'm paying someone to be on Twitter. What am I getting for that? And so I think... I think the expectations haven't changed for people who get how a community is beneficial. But I think when mm -hmm. that part is left out of the equation, and I think that happens more often now, um, the expectation changes into bottom line, how do I get dollars today out of this? Which those of us who work with communities, we know that that is a short-sighted strategy and it's overlooking mm -hmm. some of the, some of the ways that you can be of service to people who would then potentially be your fans, repeat customers, what have you. So I think it's a traffic jam in some ways um, that, that might cause people to skip over the things that you and I, Janet, consider to be fundamentals. Um, but then there are still those out there who, who kind of have our way of thinking. Um, and I think mm -hmm. over time, if you, if you pay attention to communities, you can kind of tell which you're dealing with. Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious sometimes if, if uh, you know, the community, quote unquote, isn't really a community, but it's it's a place where people want to market. And I think that's that's one of the things that, you know, Brian brings up, too, in his question that, you know, community managers are often pushed to tell the brand story and more to be marketers than they are to be community managers. And, you know, changing that trend might be very difficult, but, you know, what kind of ideas do you have around or what's what tactics have you used to kind of meld those two things? So management's still happy. You know, we want management to be happy, but we can't make the community happy if that's all we do. So yeah. how can we kind of work those things together? You know, this is a hard question. Um, it, it's a, yes. it's an ongoing challenge for a lot of people. I am incredible. And part of the reason this question is hard for me is because I've just been super lucky because the people that I've worked with, um, they have such good vision and good understanding about <clears throat> what we're talking about here. Um, I think mm -hmm. the only way you know, maybe maybe it starts from the top and maybe it's somebody at the top who's leaving those that person or those people out of the room. Maybe you need to get to someone in the middle and help them get to, to someone at the top. It might just be an old fashioned um, lobbying <laughs> campaign that you might have to do. Um, of course, there's data out there to support this. I mean, you could do research if, if your leadership is the type that responds to numbers. 
um, there's research to be had that supports um, including your community professionals in the conversation, in the important conversations and making that leg of things significant and, and just as relevant as, as other things. Um, you can use data or you could just use uh, a repetitive lobbying campaign. Those are the only, I mean, honestly, those are my only suggestions. Or you can have those people go and talk to the people that I know, know what they're talking about, like Brian Fanzo, like Jay Bear, like Dan Newman, um, mm -hmm. you know, like Rachel Miller. Um, so, yeah, just give them my number. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. How's that? What about I? I think that I think that's a good answer. I think there is a lot that we can do to kind of cross them, cross over on both of them, you know, and really kind of bring those things together. And it's really about if management, for example, will let you tell the story in a way that is community centric instead of giving you messaging that you have to deliver, because that's not necessarily going to work. Um, you know, it's not it's not really going to be engaging. Um, you know, Laura says in the chat that she likes when communities are transparent about their goals and purpose. When it's written down and clear, then it's for customer education and not marketing. And I think that's, you know, really a great point um, yeah. for growing a community, but also for maintaining a community and making people feel like they're not being preyed upon, which is never good. Yeah, nobody wants to feel manipulated or hornswoggled by, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I thought this is what was going on here, but really, you know, yeah, that's that's never a good thing. And it's a lot easier um, to gain someone's trust initially than it is to get it back if you've lost it. I mean, yeah, especially now with so many things out there for any of us, no matter what your hobby is or your interest or, or what you're trying to accomplish, there are so many options at your disposal for getting there, uh, for finding that community or that information. So if you if you burn it by, you know, betraying trust, then you're, you're pretty much done with that person. Yeah. And you're not just done like with that person either. You're done with everybody. Right. Because, you know, if we see you being inauthentic in your community, it doesn't matter who you're addressing. And we forget that, that, you know, people come back, whether it's a forum or a tweet or a Facebook group or whatever the, the setting is, if people see you being inauthentic, especially out of contest, you're toast. Yeah. And forever. Agreed. And like, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a little mini stroke right now because I'm talking about how I'm, I'm working in community with Convince and Convert. And right now there's nothing super exciting going on there. And I'm, I'm like, Ugh. But it's because I have all these things now. I really just met with the team for the first time ever a couple of weeks ago. And that's when I got my whole, okay, I want to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And then can I do it? Like, so now I have a green light and I have all these big plans that are going to start any day now, you guys. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. But I'm twitchy right this minute because we're sitting here talking about community. And if you go and look at today, for example, on our Twitter handle, you'd be like, who is this person? And what is she talking about? Because I don't see anything awesome going on here. But trust me, you guys, just stand oh, by. Come on. Stand by. Oh, no, but it's important. On. It's important though. But one thing that I will shout out Jay for, he's awesome. I was like, can I do this? Can I do this? He's like, go do the stuff. Go do it. So that's always good. That's always good to be trusted. It's important if you're working in community for someone or for an organization to be trusted, to be included in the discussion, like Brian mentioned, that's huge. So give that girl some props right now, because that is serious. You know, if you want to set up a community and you don't trust your community manager and their expertise and all of the th all of the tools that they bring to the table, that you've probably been kind of ignorant about because nobody knows all of this. You need somebody who can exactly hands in the air. She's, you know, a great community manager comes to the table saying, here's a whole bunch of ideas that I can do to make this really work. Are you going to let me run with it? Or are you going to cut me off the knees? Exactly. Make the right choice people. <laughs> and yeah. And, and honestly, if you, and like you were saying, Janet, if you have those, if you have that mindset that you're kind of closed off to the idea of a genuine community, um, you don't do it. <laughs> Just go mm -hmm. buy Facebook ads or do, do something else. But like, don't, don't, don't do a community badly and selfishly. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And that's something that, you know, as Beezer asked this question before about how have com community expectations changed over the last two years. And I don't know if it's the last two years, or the last five, or maybe even the last 10, but community has changed a lot. And partly because we're empowered now with so much better tools, we can actually listen to the community and the people in it outside of the actual physical community itself, mm -hmm. which empowers us a lot with better information, Agreed. better ways to talk to people, understand their voice. Um, what kind of research do you do around, you know, the community that you're building right now? I mean, there's a huge uh, following for Convince and Convert. So how can you learn about that community in order to engage them better? A lot of snooping on social media, a lot of um, she's wearing the hat. Look, looking at the individuals that are really already quite supportive. Um, and it's amazing to me that there are a lot of them. It's an interesting challenge because Convince and Convert is associated with Jay. And Jay is this like megastar, uh, my words. Um, so it's an interesting challenge to take Convince and Convert, which didn't even have a Twitter handle last year and try to create a community around that, which obviously is going to be associated with Jay, but will be different and involve the rest of the team. So I've been doing for the past couple months since I've started, I've been doing just a ton of listening and reading. I've been reading the blogs of some of our big supporters. I have been sharing some of their content. I have been, um, just doing a lot of social listening for the most part. And then I do have some other opportunities for insight using tools, using some of our own data. For example, people that subscribe to the definitive newsletter, that's a whole treasure trove of information at my disposal. Right. Um, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of listening and reading um, to be honest. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about specific tools that people who may be starting a new community could use to find the people that they're going to bring into that community before they get it rolling to kind of learn more about who's out there and, and what they can do. Yeah, there are tons of tools and I've always, until recently, I've, I've been sort of a, a starving artist of tool user, like not using enterprise level tools, cobbling together solutions that were, I could justify on my budget as a freelancer, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I definitely think that that would apply to a lot of people. So there are, there are tools that I personally love, like um, SpiderCube. It runs, I want to say, like 50 bucks a month or something. And But you can get an intense amount of data out of it by uh, filtering. And then you can create lists. So basically, you go in and you put in your criteria. And it will give you the people that are talking about what you said. Um, and it's a little bit more sophisticated than kind of doing it yourself with a Twitter search or an internet search. So I like that one a lot. Um, I like, um, I actually- Do you use BuzzSumo? I do, BuzzSumo is really great. Um, and again, it's just a way to sort of gather information about who's talking about a specific topic. Um, there's, there's another one um, that I really enjoy that I just started using recently actually called Zoomf which I don't know that depending, it depends on what you're looking for as to what you get, like what, what filters you put in, but you can find out who's talking about a given thing and how often they're talking about it and how influential you are, which I would argue that if you're trying to build a community, that last piece doesn't matter so much. Um, <laughs> it can matter though, if you're looking, but for example, what if you're looking for a blogger to help you talk about your message um, and, and, inquire of people on the internet, you know, you, these things can be, they're, they're nuances. It can be relevant. Um, gosh, tools. There are so many. Um, I have access to a lot of tools now that are pretty sweet, like rival IQ. You can get a lot of data about social activity from rival IQ. There's one called little bird. Um, I love little really, bird. Yeah. It's a really interesting uh, tool. So, but I actually, for me personally, I use these tools um, periodically, but I'm very um, into looking at the actual platforms on social media. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of my snooping on Twitter natively, on Facebook natively. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in terms I think of like something, no, go ahead. I, I was really done. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> 
I think that's something that people overlook. I mean, there's a couple of things, right? A lot of my clients, they're not at the enterprise level. And for my own consulting practice, I tend to use the lower cost tools. But I have to say some of the enterprise tools give so much over information that I see clients struggling with what to do with all the information. They just get flooded and they don't yeah. know what to do with it. And then they've spent thousands of dollars for something they don't even know how to use. I love that you do a lot of organic and native searching because I think that we understand a lot more that way of what people are really saying and looking at individual profiles and getting to know who users are that you know could be really helpful and, and maybe be mavens on their own and attract Absolutely. people to the community. I'm really kind of old fashioned. <laughs> And so like I'm sitting here now talking to you, I have a desktop computer and I love it. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have a laptop and I use it, but only when I can't be at my desk. So mm -hmm. I'm old fashioned. And then when I feel like I'm, if I'm looking for something in Twitter and I'm in the actual platform, this is just me. I feel like I have more context on it when I find it. Um, some of the tools mm -hmm. are awesome for delivering, you know, information to you, but I like to just see it in context. Um, and, and that's, that's useful to me. It's not useful to everyone, but you're right. Mm -hmm. You hit on an important point about over information, like with any data or insight that you want to get from data. If you're looking at the wrong factors or too many factors or irrelevant factors combined with relevant factors, then you might end up with faulty conclusions. So the most important exactly. thing to, to keep in mind with any tool use, with anything that you're doing is what is the information that I want? What do I need to know? And then try to keep your search or your return of data limited to that. I don't need to know how many people that are interested in Convince and Convert are wearing red shirts today. I could probably <laughs> find out, but that's not going to help me. It's only going to muddy the waters. <laughs> oh, I right. can probably find out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but you know, you, that's it's a little your point was very important there. Um, decide what information is going to be helpful and then try to try to keep it within those confines. That's the whole thing Whatever with everybody is using. obsessed with big data and big data is really cool and all, but you still have to go down to the little data, especially if you're really dealing with individuals and communities, you know, you need to get down to the small data and find out who they are and what makes them tick and what they really like as opposed to, you know, how many Facebook pages they've liked, which is almost an irrelevant thing. It is an irrelevant thing. Big data thing. might tell me that somebody said you're number one. Looking at it more closely, looking at the little data will tell me that they also put a middle finger emoji by that. So, you know, <laughs> those are not the same thing, right? It's, it's all about the context. Yes. So no offense to my yeah. big data look friends in the room but <laughs> well big data is you know? good like I said you just got to know what to do with it right yeah and it's all about the insight that you get yeah mm -hmm. and there is there is more than ever there is more and more information more and more data available to us all enterprise tools are not always the answer um, sometimes no. you can get more of a result for your for your needs from one of the cheap or free tools um, that are out there so it is about tailoring your searches, your tools to what's actually going to be useful. And you have to start there. You have to start with what you need based on your goal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mitch asked that question. And I think you just answered it really well. Can the search for too much info actually harm businesses from growing and succeeding? Or is that what separates success from desire? What's the ROI? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if I mean, if you're if what you're doing <clears throat> is getting information that's not going to tie back into your business goals, then you've wasted time and money and you maybe missed opportunities because you draw drew a faulty conclusion based on the wrong data. So it's about it's about the right information versus the amount. Yeah. And I think a lot of times if people don't feel like their community is taking off or they don't feel like their messaging is getting out, then they'll dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the data and get so mired in that, that they don't spend any time talking to the community, which is- Exactly, so and I would rather, you're so right. I would rather, at that point, I would rather go and find one or two people that I know are plugged in and go, why am I getting crickets? Can I, can I pick your brain? What do you think about this? Yes. I would rather get that one or two answers mm -hmm. um, than, you know, 
a ton of more data that may or may not really tie into what the problem is. Quality over quantity. Old school is not, <laughs> it, it can be good. It can be good to just do it the easy way, the simple way, the direct way. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to switch gears a little bit around community by using a content calendar and not specifically for we're going to shove content down your throat in a very time way and it's all going to be the same and it's all the messaging, blah, 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 blah. Instead, let's talk about how you can use a content calendar to kind of guide the conversations within the community. That's a good idea. Um, I actually have just been working on a, a content calendar for my team and it's very filled in in a generic sense and a template sense for now in terms of days of the week and things that we you know might want to do on those days but it includes things like on a certain day of the week we're going to feature people from a certain part of our community i don't want to say a whole lot of specifics on this right now but we're going to feature people from a certain part of our community so that what that's going to do, first of all, it's going to start a dialogue when I initially reach out to the person who's going to be featured this week or next week and ask the questions. Hey, do you mind if we if we shout you out next week? Um, here's three questions. Would you mind? And then I you know, make a graphic or make a video or whatever it's going to be. That's in the content calendar so that we can we can keep it as part of our um, ongoing story, an ongoing dialogue with the community. And the idea behind that is not us trying to disseminate the information so much as trying to start a conversation around it, trying mm -hmm. to shine a light on people who are already part of the conversation and get more people involved and get them to talk to each other. We don't even have to be part of the conversation at that point, which I think is a, a hallmark of a good community when those conversations can take place. But back to your question. So content calendar. So we will have that on. It's on the content calendar. Um, there are other things on the content calendar that are around um, user generated content and uh, polls and things that we're going to ask the community, not just to get answers to things we might want to know, but really to try to get them to talk more with each other around something that we've picked up on as of interest to them specifically. But all of this is in the calendar so that we don't lose track of what we're trying to do over a longer mm -hmm. period of time. And when you work in community, you can easily lose track of, of time. And, oh, it's Wednesday. I was going to do this today and it's not there. Content calendar is really helpful. And the other good thing about that is that everyone on the team, even the people who aren't forward facing on the community side, can see it. And they can comment or ask questions. So that's kind of where I am on that idea for the moment. Have you, we taught you mentioned this a little bit before, but I want to elaborate on a little bit. Do you go to your community to help develop that content calendar and, and the direction of where the community is going to go? You know, I haven't, but I think that, I think that one could. And I think that maybe once I become a little bit more, satisfied with what what's going on in the community that I'm talking about once I see that that we're being more helpful maybe that that I would do that I think it would be um, I think it could be really useful um, it goes back to a sense of being a stakeholder or some ownership right I mean obviously right. you're going to have your parameters in mind there are things that you will do there are things that you won't do but why not go ahead and ask you know your most interested and engaged community members to be part of that. They probably have awesome ideas. So I probably will do that. Um, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit further down the road in this case, mm -hmm. um, because give something first. <laughs> so I'm in the, I'm in the let's give something phase, but I, I think it's a really good idea. And I would encourage people who do already have a very healthy, engaged community to definitely consider doing that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I do, too, because I think, you know, like you said, we want them to have a sense of ownership. We want people to be really vested in the success of the community because it is kind of their community. It's a little different when it's a forum or a group than it is when it's a broader community, you know, such as what's going on with Convince and Convert. There's so many different platforms. And so. You know, you've got to manage all of those platforms and figure out what's going on across all of them. Um, I think a content calendar can be very helpful to 
kind of make sure the team all has an idea of direction and to kind of guide them and, you know, get their engagement. Um, how do you get a team to buy in to, and this may be an early question for you, um, you know, how do you get the team to buy in to where the content's going or to feel vested maybe? And that's, maybe that's where I'm going with that. The leadership. Um, it's all, for, for my perspective, it's all about the leadership. So the team that we're talking about in my case right now, they're already bought in because they're so in sync. It, it, this is a broader issue, like it relates to the culture and the vision of the, of the entire group. And that is top down. It, it really comes from the top. So I don't actually have to ask them for buy in. They've given it to me without me asking. But the other thing, as it relates to that, the, the content calendar is a great way for the community manager or community managers who maybe are the, the one or several people in the organization doing something different than what everybody else is doing. The content mm -hmm. calendar is another way to stay tethered to the rest of the team because they can see um, they can see what you're what you're doing, what you're bringing to the table on a regular basis. And then they know, ideally, if it's being done right from the top down, then they know that they can weigh in on it with their thoughts and ideas. Yeah. And that's so. really powerful. If you can get your team to feel a sense of ownership in the content calendar and maybe that it's going to spin off ideas for them to come up with their own content so that you're not trying, and I'm sure that you're not doing that in this case, because I know convince and convert, but you know, a lot of times the community manager is the one who has to come up with all of the content all of the time, which can be so labor intensive and not really healthy for the community either. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a plethora of content to work with already that I don't have to create. <laughs> so I do a little, I do a little uh, tweaking or supplementing. Um, I am get excited to, to get started with some of this community about the community related content. I'm really, really nerding out over that. Um, but another thing I wanted to mention back to the, the idea of um, asking for community input on the content calendar. One of the first things that we said during the hour was that you can sometimes start a dialogue and get crickets. Mm -hmm. um, that could also happen when you ask for input on what you're doing, even if your community is doing well, if you ask for input on what you're doing, or let's say you ask for input on your content calendar, you might get crickets when you ask that too. But I think it's still worth asking and making the effort and maybe mm -hmm. asking more than once. So I think some community managers are afraid to show any form of weakness. They don't want anybody to know that they're struggling to build a community because they feel that then the community is going to walk away. Um, mm. But I think it can be very empowering for the community to know that you want their help and that you care about what they think. So there's a line there, right? Yeah, I agree. I think that anyone, if it's a public facing community, anyone can see what it is and what it isn't. So what's the point in posturing? You know, I, I tend to, when I get insecure, I tend to just go uber transparent and go, oh my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. you guys, this is terrible. Sorry. You know, like, and just be honest about it because it's all there. It's already out there. You can mm -hmm. see what there is and what there isn't. Just like I made a comment earlier about how I'm not happy with how something looks, you know, today. Um, I don't see the point. I, I, that mentality, I think may be, may go beyond just the idea of community. It might be something that's kind of come to me with age and experience that I just, I don't, I know that I can't hide. I know that it is what it is. So I'm much more willing to just kind of call it like I see it and, or try to, you know, be a little self deprecating, but also to in so doing, you can, you can express the fact that you, you do care and you're working on it or you want, you want it to be better. That goes a long way. That goes a long it's way sincere. if people know that you're trying, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're sincere, you're authentic. And, you know, I think that's um, okay. We have a couple of really old time community managers in this one today. So we're both kind of old school, but I think that's something that new community managers or younger community managers can learn from is that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just about pushing out a message. It's, 
if you're going to be the community manager, then step up and be present and let people know who you are and what you stand for, because we're much more likely to trust you and want to talk to you if you do that. Yeah. Um, when we had our Convince and Convert meeting, I, I'm still kind of getting to know Jay and, and that was my first time meeting a team. And so we we literally we had meetings and we we're in a meeting and something came up that was part of my wheelhouse. And he asked me a question and I turned around. I, I wanted to be sure I understood what he wants, but I turned around and I asked him, I said, well, do you want to blah, blah, blah. And he said, you're the community manager. You don't <laughs> ask me. So I was like, noted. <laughs> you're absolutely <laughs> right. Noted. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, I think it can be hard. And I, I mean, no disrespect. I think I think it can be hard for younger people who have less experience in just the world, just in mm -hmm. being kind of kicked around a little bit in life. Um, no disrespect. But I think the more times that you've had to get back up from whatever, not just professional things or community, but I think I think that resilience that you can only get with experience is helpful. So I think it can be a challenge for a young person to be that pinball at times. But I also think it's a good challenge to embrace. I think um, there are a lot of young people out there who can handle it and, you know, just be confident in your abilities and just communicate well with the people that you work with. Um, so much to be learned. And especially if you are working with a business, with a community that's around business goals, you're going to, you're going to be on a roller coaster probably. Um, but it's definitely a worthwhile thing and there's much to be learned. So, Yeah, it's an interesting combination. I think it takes a certain lack of ego and at the same time, a really strong sense of self and confidence in your ability to be able to manage it. And, you know, that particularly comes up when you get something really negative that happens. Say you've got a troll or something bad happens in the organization and people start hammering you on the boards. You know, how do you respond to, you know, things? OK, let's split that up. How do you respond to honest, real, negative comments? And then we'll talk about trolls. <laughs> do you mean in the do you mean within the community? Yes. Or OK. Um, the first thing I want to do is get to the to make sure that I understand what the comment means, because especially in social, we can shorthand uh, context can get lost, you know, if we're being sarcastic or we didn't really fully express our thought because 140 characters, whatever the case may be. So the first thing that needs to happen um, stat is what is this person actually driving at? And then. Why? And what can be done to address it? Um, and it's not always just, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, know what you're sorry for. Or if you actually are sorry, Let, let's nail it down. Let's get to the root of whatever it is. And sometimes that's quite simple and done easily. Sometimes it requires a much longer conversation. Mm -hmm. But as my friends um, over on CMG or Hangout are, are fond of saying a lot of the times, if someone cares enough to give you negative feedback, um, then that's a really good person to talk to because they care enough. So get to the get to the bottom line of what their concern is. And quite frankly, sometimes you can really take that feedback and turn it into a change, turn it into something constructive. Maybe there's something that you were doing every Tuesday because you thought the community loved it. Nobody ever said they didn't love it. And then, you know, Joe says, this sucks. Please stop doing it. And you go, whoa. Well, then you can learn a lot by having that conversation. So first understand, this is getting very Stephen Covey of me, but first understand <laughs> and then have a conversation and, re and resolve it to, to one extent or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I absolutely agree with that, that, you know, approaching the whole situation with compassion. You know, I read something the other day and I have no idea, maybe it was Stephen Covey, but somebody said that, when you hear a comment and you know it's a negative comment, you really just have to stop and pause and say, okay, where is this coming from? Is it valid or not? You know, and then we have people who are clearly just trying to get a rise out of you. And you know, those are the trolls. And dealing with trolls is a very different thing. You know, I mean, sure, we want to go, OK, is this valid? Oh, nope, it's bullshit. So how do we deal with trolls in a community? 
First, make sure they are a troll. So don't get defensive about every person that disagrees with you, even if they're kind of rude about it. Like, make sure you understand what the actual message is. And then once you've actually identified someone as genuinely trolling, do not feed them. Um, if necessary, you block, you boot, you old school ban hammer, whatever that is. But the key thing there is to make the distinction. Ban hammer. <laughs> no, the key thing there is to make the distinction. Um, because, you know, if, if somebody's genuinely a troll, one of the one of the things that I think makes them a troll is that you can't win them over and they don't want to be won over. So there's nothing constructive to be gained there. So you have to make that determination first. Um, and in, in closed communities or communities that are on their own platform, it can be really key to have good um, community guidelines in place that can eliminate you, you're being the jerk. You just have those guidelines and you go, okay, sorry, but this is like not, this is against um, the, the guidelines. So mm -hmm. please don't do it. And then they do it again and then you just kick them out. Um, you don't engage. It's harder when you're talking about social media because you can't refer back to a, a set of rules. Um, you have to be a little bit more um, philosophical about it, but just don't feed the trolls. Have I ever done it? Trolls. Yes. Yes, I've done it. We've all, I think every, I think everyone's done it. Um, it, but you learn from that. You go, Oh, why did I do that? You know, sometimes it's really fun to poke the trolls. You I know, have my moments. Sometimes it's just, <laughs> you know, we all do. We yeah. all have our moments, but it's also interesting because, you know, if you step back, if somebody's trolling on say your Facebook page, then you can step back and go, okay, I'm not going to say anything for a little while. I'm just going to ignore this person and see if the community responds. But then you also have the additional problem of telling your community, okay, he's a troll. You know, please don't <laughs> respond to her. It's not really what it seems. I will say, though, I think that the community getting involved around something like that, while it can be bad in the long term of you having to, like, squelch that additional layer of what's happening, mm -hmm. can also be a really good indicator of the health of your community because if the community is yes. like we're not having this then you know people are are they're affectionate toward each other toward the community and that's so it's a good it's a good sign for the health of your community it just may be something that you have to to get involved in sort of squash yeah rachel makes a good point that success brings trolls uh just it, like it fake followers you know i mean you'll get all of this influx of spam on your blog. If it's a new blog post, you yes. know, and you get a ton of spam, you've arrived because now you've got to deal with junk. But, you know, it really does. It is an indication. And another thing, too, like for a community manager, when there's something negative, be it a troll or be it legitimate negative feedback, it, we have to have enough ego to care about doing making our communities great and helping them be great on their own. So you got to have enough ego, but you don't want to have too much. And one thing that I try to do, and the key word here is try because I'm human, is ask myself the question when something like that comes up, is this a community problem or is this a Kristen problem? Mm. What's happening here? And that's a really good filter that I try to apply. I learned it in the, in the workplace outside of community to try to put that filter to it. Is this a problem for the goal for the community or is it just a problem for me? And when you get that, it's just a problem for me thing. That's right when off. you stop and go, okay, now I need to get over myself. I didn't like this. I'm going to go say some curse words in the other room, but it's got nothing to do with the, the goal or the community. So I'm going to move mm -hmm. past it. That's really a great point. Cause we do get really defensive and the, the longer we're in a community, and the more engaged we are and the more excited we are about the strength and the power of the community, the more often we fall victim to trolls because yes. we get really defensive. This is ours now. It's not just, you know, a job. We're very conspicuous in that way, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, definitely bullseye on your back kind of deal. So sometimes yeah. you really do just have to take a pause, ask yourself that question, maybe go have a beer, whatever it is, and then go back when you can answer that question and move on according to the bigger picture. 
And do you, Laura asks, if, if you don't respond at all to a troll, does it look like you aren't responsive and how do you avoid that? And I think that's a great question because it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. I never don't respond ever, but the response has to be the type that indicates that you're not going to continue to respond, <laughs> you know? So for example, um, I haven't had anybody troll me on Twitter lately, so I'm having a hard time coming up with an example, but you know, something like, um, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, best of luck to you. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about like my personal Twitter account. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of says good talk. You know, bye bye. Now. And then you can say more <laughs> things, but I've already responded to you and kind of, mm -hmm. kind of politely broken up with you. So, we're done. Yeah, because I think that's really important too. That again, you know, so many of these social platforms, in particular, you see everything out of context, and so if a question goes unanswered, it yeah. makes you look bad. But if you come back and you know get all negative and defensive about it they see the response out of context and it's like, wow, she's really a jerk. And Rachel, <laughs> Rachel's making a good point here in the comments. She says, I strongly mm -hmm. believe that sometimes no response is just fine. The average person can at a glance determine. I kind of agreed with that. I said, I always respond. It's, I respond because I'm just, I'm just kind of obsessive like that, but I, you're not going to get more than one out of me if you're genuinely trolling. And usually that particular comment in and of itself is going to be so egregious that, she she makes a good point that somebody could reasonably determine that that was kind of nonsense. But I do believe in responding and trying to curtail it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back and forth with you if you're trolling me. Right. Right. Well, and sometimes, you know, I, I have clients who, you know, run events, for example. And so people will troll because they want to get a free ticket or they want to get a free tchotchke or whatever the client is selling they're like, well, if I just troll, I'm going to be able to get that free thing until, you know, I won't shut up until you give it to me, which, you know, is kind of like the old blogger thing with the Crocs shoes. You remember that when the, yes. the female blogger that said, do you know who I am? You know, I mean, the power that people think they have over a brand and the power over the community can be very scary. So sometimes very, very rarely, I have deleted comments that were clearly trolls. How do you feel about deletion? I think... Um, you can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I, I actually, um, and this is interesting because I was just wondering what Jay would think, but I, I definitely think that something that's spam or abusive, you're good to delete it. You know, like buy my ebook, even though the question was about something totally different. So you're gone, right. out. Um, abuse, you're gone out. Um, trolling, Profanity. I think if a troll, let's say we're talking about Facebook and a troll said something that was maybe trolly, you're not sure, kind of ish, you respond and then they come back with a blatant trolling. I think that can go. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not because the other thing is too, when you're, when you're dealing with an individual as a community professional or enthusiast, you're dealing with an individual, you also have to weigh however you address them against the needs of the greater community. So what is the net output of that conversation and how does it affect the community as a whole? So I would be looking at that, that particular second comment at least as, okay, this is not helpful to the community. Um, it's, I care more about the community as a whole than I do about this particular comment or person. So mm -hmm. off it goes. Yeah. That's my yeah. thought. Good for you. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's always a call. It's a judgment call, you know, based on what's going on and, and how they're responding. Yeah. And context is so key. I mean, even trolls aren't all created equal. You know, one troll might just go, you suck. And that's all they say. One might go on and on with like, you know, your home address and, you know, your mother and whatever. That's totally... So now we have like echelons of trolling, right? So it's all right. about the context of each particular instance, I think, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, wow, this hour just flew by. I've had too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It's your, you're really, you're just a font of community knowledge. If people want to hang out with you on the Community Manager Hangout, um, why don't you tell people where they can find that 
And um, you know how they can learn more from you because this was great. Thank you, Janet. Absolutely. Um, CMGR Hangout. It's hashtag CMGR Hangout. It's on Fridays at 2 Eastern. It's every Friday. And um, it is hosted by my CMGR at my CMGR. So if you go to that Twitter handle, you can get the details. There's a website, um, amazing team over there that, that put together um, blog posts around the topics. They invite in different panelists each week to discuss different topics. But the good thing is that even if you can't join the live chat, um, the hangouts are, they go to YouTube. So they're all, they're all on YouTube and you can check those out. There's some diverse topics around social and community. And I would love to see any of you guys in there, whether you work in community or not. So. Yeah. And watching the replays are, is really awesome because you can, you can find them on YouTube and you know, it's really, it's a, it's a great resource. And, you know, we're really going to look for seeing what you do with convince and convert. We're going to be lurking now and watching you and maybe trolling a little. Hey, bring it. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I'm worthy. Ooh, bring it on. Did I just hear a challenge? <laughs> hey, I, I got to prove my worth. <laughs> so let's do this. There you go. Well, it's really been great having you on. I'm going to pause the recording, but thank you, everyone. This was a great chat with some wonderful questions. And uh, Kristen, you're just amazing. So I'm so.